success classes. And uh, I'm sure many of you have been attending the classes since February. And uh, you, you would have noticed that we are building it step by step, how a home gardener can get a lot of success from their backyard gardens. So either it is uh, vegetables, fruits, or flowers, we have covered everything. So today uh, we are going to cover a very, very important topic, uh, which is about our garden pests and diseases. Before we do that, let me introduce myself to all of you, even though most of you know, uh, have heard this before. My name is Suma Mudan, and I have been a master gardener since 2014. And uh, it has been one of the most enriching experiences of my gardening life. And uh, um, we have uh, run this landscape success program for the last few years. Uh, we have gone virtual uh, since COVID, which is working really well because it is uh, now accessible to a lot more people than in person. But in future, we may bring a combination of in-person and virtual, depending on what people prefer. Um, so today's speaker is Nancy Schaefer. She is a veteran gardener, not only gardener, she is a, she's an expert entomologist, and she knows everything about those bugs, those diseases, and uh, you know all the things that pester us in our gardens, uh, everything about the pests. So Nancy grew up in a farm in West Central Texas. There she gardened with family, especially her grandmother, and most of the things come from her grandmothers or mothers, either our cooking or gardening, mostly. Uh, and everywhere else she has lived. Gardening has been a source of pleasure, food and beauty, as well as physical and mental wellness her whole life. She has been a Fort Bend Master Gardener since 2004. She has 10 years over me. Uh, she feels the Master Gardening program is important because it provides a chance to learn more about gardening to teach community members about gardening and to make new friends. I can't emphasize the last one more. So we have made some lifelong friends and we keep learning every time we have one of these sessions. So thank you for doing this today for us, Nancy, sharing your knowledge and I will turn it on to you. So Nancy Schaaf, who is uh, the director of our program, she is going to Mute all of you guys and also disable your videos because this program is being recorded. Okay, are we ready? The uh, title of our program today is Landscape Success, Managing Pests and Diseases. Uh, we've all experienced uh, those two things in our garden. Sometimes we handle it well, sometimes we uh, are a little bit stumped. So hopefully we'll give you some information about that. Um, the, um, the beneficial insects and pests uh, are two things that we'll talk about. Plus we'll talk about diseases and uh, will you talk about IPM, which I think you've heard if you've watched some of the others. These are five things that I think um, you are uh, could do to make your gardening uh, more successful. Uh, one of the things is to be in your garden regularly, daily if possible. If you can't do that, maybe do front yard in the in the morning, backyard in the afternoon, uh, every other day. Uh, divide it up. Uh, another thing is to take a child out with you. They can see a lot more things than you do. Believe it or not. Uh, find and identify problems early, follow the IPM uh, strategies, welcome beneficial insects and other garden helpers, and plant a variety of plants. We'll talk about all of those as we go along today. So what is IPM? Um, it, I think this has been uh, brought out several times in some of the previous uh, uh, programs. Integrated pest, pest management is environmentally friendly, common sense, and even economical approach to controlling insects. What's a pest? Uh, we probably all have our definition of that, but in the garden, a pest is an insect or other arthropod, plant disease, a weed, 
uh, and, or any other organism that may negatively affect the plants in our garden. Um, any other organism could be a, um, could be ticks or mites, those would be arthropods, could be um, squirrels, uh, rats, mice, uh, in my yard, armadillos, um, several things like that that could be considered a pest and something that you'd need to control. So in the strategies for IPM, there are some steps that we'll go through. We're going to try to figure out how we can identify the problem or the pest. We can determine the severity of the problem, uh, what you can stand, what you can't, when you decide that you need to assess some management options, and there are uh, a lot. You need to select and apply one or more options. We might try one thing and then decide that's not working and try another. Ask for advice uh, whenever you're selecting these options if you're not sure. The last two, five and six, have to do with what happens afterwards. Measure the success of the options that you used and record the results. I don't always do this. I'm sure a lot of gardeners don't always do this, but it would be helpful if we did because we're not gonna remember everything, believe it or not. So if you would keep a journal uh, uh, that says what you did to each plant, how if, if whatever your option you chose was worthwhile, write that down. If nothing else, put a, a rubber band or something around the, uh, the pesticide or uh, make a note on your phone, put a rubber band around it and put down what you did when you did it, that sort of thing. Uh, do something on your phone. Uh, you can do it on your computer. You can make a, a paper journal if that's what you uh, would like to do. But that will be very helpful. Another thing I've found helpful, and I do try to do this, I write down the name and of the plant that I, new plant that I bought, and I say where I got it, and I say where I put it. Uh, those are things that you might want to put in that journal. So let's go back to sorting um, and our uh, scouting and identifying the problems that are there. One of the things that you can do when you're scouting is to take a container with you and capture the insect if that's what it is. If it's something that's wrong with the leaf, you can uh, take, the, take a leaf off, put it in a little plastic bag or something so that it doesn't dry out right away, and then you'll be able to bring it in the house and look at it. Traps um, are sometimes thought of as ways to, uh, to uh, kill insects, but they don't have to be just for that, and they will normally kill insects. Uh, sticky traps placed in your garden uh, will let you know what is there. Maybe these are things that are, are affecting your garden that uh, you can't really see or find. Um, the little tiny things will uh, stick to these or be attracted to these. Uh, yellow and blue seem to be the colors that most insects are attracted to. So you could make your own trap by taking a sandwich bag, putting a piece of yellow or blue paper that fits inside of it, zip it up, spread some um, petroleum jelly on it, not too thick, uh, be, figure out some way to hang it on a stake in the garden and then go back and look at it later. Some like this one, uh, the one at the end, will um, have a pheromone in it that attracts uh, insects. Um, the other thing you can do is get a magnifying glass or a hand lens of some kind. Uh, the little jeweler's loops usually have uh, anywhere from 10 to 20, or if you get one that's got two lenses on it, it would be, uh, that would be useful too. Some of the things you're gonna find that are pests are very, very tiny. Those can be put in your pocket and there's many of those. Uh, many different kinds. Some of them have a light. Um, so those are very worthwhile. A lot of the gardeners I know carry one of these in their pocket. Uh, you can also take photos. They need to be good and clear because you may need to send them to someone to help you with identification. There are apps uh, for identifying insects and diseases. 
that you can download on your computer. Be sure that your um, personal data is, uh, is not uh, is not going to be compromised. Uh, two of the ones uh, that I know of that we use, um, I like uh, Google Lens. Uh, I have Android. If you have Apple, uh, there's a, there are others available. And um, on um, I, I Naturalist is a good or, is a good one to also use. Uh, there is there are some things in the um, uh, sources for attendees. Uh, I think they'll show that at the end or send it or email it to you, and you can uh, look at those. There's some some even how how to use videos on um, using these apps. Then the other thing you can do is you can ask for help. Uh, we have a hotline at uh, Master Gardeners. There's somebody there at least two days a week, maybe more, uh, who can uh, listen to your problem if you call. Uh, you can fill out a form and there you can put your photograph uh, so that they can help you and they'll get back to you. Uh, if they don't answer the phone, you can leave a message and they'll also get back to you that way. It's a very good resource. You can look online. Uh, if you do take a photo for identification, you need to check that identification, uh, the answer that you got back with a reliable source like bugguide.net. Uh, that's also in the resources at the end. Um, are uh, a university site, a and or some university in, in our part of the country, uh, University of Florida, University of uh, North Carolina, uh, LSU, those all have pretty good uh, sites. So take the name that you got uh, from the app, the, the uh, scientific name, as well as a common name, and uh, search it in bug guide or online to see if it matches up. Remember where you live because it's, if you find an identification that is for um, Wyoming, might not, that insect might not be here. So let's start with, uh, with um, go on with recognizing plant damage and determine the action uh, that you, you wanna take and what you, uh, what kind of uh, threshold you have. Um, if you saw a plant like the one in the first picture, uh, you might think, I've got to do something right now. Uh, if you saw a, a plant uh, in the second picture, you might think, uh, well, maybe I don't need to do anything just yet. But if you look at it with your little hand lens, You'll notice that there are a lot of little white things, but there are a lot of little yellow things. Those are either little mites or aphids. I think they were aphids on this particular plant. So that makes a big difference uh, in, uh, in what you choose to do. Um, the um, other thing that you can do is to determine whether all the leaves look like that, just one or two. Um, if it's one or two, maybe it's not such a big problem. It's all of them. Maybe it will be. Look at do all the plants that are a lot that are like that one have the same problem? Is there a lot of damage from what you see? And then um, after that, you're going to have your photo, and then you might be able you will be able to ask for help with someone else. Um, this whoops, go back to that. Um, a plant that has damage like this, you could take uh, a leaf and keep it with you, and then you can can look what uh, look up maybe what what is black stuff on my leaf look, and then you might be able to find some answers that way. This is a little squiggly line that's leaf miner. We'll talk about those in a minute. This is Venca, a popular bedding plant. You've got one over here that's very wilted. You need to determine what's causing that. If it's not too dry or too wet, then there may be a disease issue. If you see a plant that's so heavily infected or infested with something like this scale, you really might wanna consider taking that plant out of your garden, putting it in a garbage can, a bag and disposing of it. And we'll talk about some of those, uh, some of those things later. So one of the other things, uh, whenever you're um, 
um, out in the garden is uh, an option that is to promote and protect habitats to attract beneficial insects and other arthropods uh, like spiders, uh, lizards, birds, all of those things that are in your garden already. They are insect eaters. You want to keep them that way and you want them to stay. So make your yard friendly for them. Uh, birds like this little wren that we've had, a, I don't know how many pairs we've had in our yard for many years. Um, they scour daily for caterpillars and other insects to feed their babies. So they, they really do take care of a lot of insects. The little anoles that we have uh, eat insects. The problem with this one is that's a good insect. Um, our um, frogs and toads uh, also eat insects. People may be a little squeamish about snakes, but the smaller ones especially eat insects. Uh, they also may eat other uh, uh, things like mice uh, that are in your yard. Uh, this is a picture that's just sort of a conglomeration of things. It's mostly mites, but there are some very, very tiny flies, uh, parasitic flies and parasitic wasps that are just a tremendous uh, benefit to your garden. And then the spiders, sometimes we don't like spiders. I think a lot of it is their web. If we get it on us, it's a little creepy, but the spiders themselves patrol our weight uh, for insects on plants and eat them. So those are a few things that we wanna want to uh, keep in our garden. Okay, some beneficial insects that we have. Um, go through this pretty quickly. Um, this is a wheel bug that uh, looks menacing, but uh, it's got that long pointed uh, mouth part that it can poke into insects and suck their juices out. So that's a good one. Flies around making a lot of noise. Robber flies. Um, Great acrobats that can hold on with one leg and eat an insect just about. Um, the little uh, surfid flies, these are two of them. The, um, the larva is the one that eats insects. They're very, very, uh, very small, uh, hard to see, but they're very important in uh, controlling uh, small insects, very tiny pests. We have lady beetles, also very important. They're not all red and black and spotted. This is a lady beetle that uh, is very uh, good at controlling insects. The, um, the little larva looks like a mealybug, but it's much smaller. Uh, you can see the aphid there. And the um, uh, two spotted lady beetles, uh, we're going to look at its uh, larva later on. And uh, this is what the lady, the uh, larva of our normal, what we think of as lady beetles generally looks like. Um, wasp, uh, no, people don't like the paper wasp, especially if they, they build their nest uh, over your back door, your front door. Uh, these are, this little wasp is small. It'll make its nest in um, anything. This happens to be some bamboo stakes that I had leaning up against the house. Uh, they capture caterpillars and put them in uh, these tubes. Uh, then they'll put something over that, lay an egg, put something over that, and just keep going so that they have layers, several layers of those. This is a little potter's wasp. You may have seen it, uh, these little pots on your screen or on your house or on a plant leaf. Um, those have caterpillars on them that, that they lay their egg in there. They stuff it full of caterpillars for their babies to eat. This is when we were having trouble, a lot of trouble with sod webworms. And that's what nearly every one of those was when I broke open that one. Uh, mud daubers, we definitely don't like making their nests on our house, but they are also hunters and will fill theirs. There's these holes up where they've laid their egg with, um, uh, with caterpillars and other things. They'll, they'll put spiders in there, they'll put all kinds of things. The, uh, this is a large caterpillar uh, known as a hornworm. All of these little things on it are cocoons that uh, contain a, uh, a wasp. The little tiny wasp, which is about this size over here, uh, will um, um, 
lay its eggs on the caterpillar and um, then when they hatch, they eat the inside of the caterpillar. Then when they get to a certain stage, they come out, they make a, a cocoon. And then you've got all of these little wasps that you've lived, uh, that have now have in your garden to help you control uh, insects. The uh, bees, of course, are important for our um, pollination. Uh, this is a fire ant. That's a forward fly. Forward fly lays an egg on the ant's head and uh, the uh, larva eats its way through the head. The head falls off. The new forward fly crawls out. Uh, this is an ensign wasp. Very helpful because it lays eggs on cockroach egg, uh, lays its eggs on cockroach egg cases, and its uh, its uh, babies will eat um, inside that case, and then we get another uh, ensign wasp. This is a beneficial stink bug. Notice that it's got these points up on the thorax. This is a beetle. That mouth is used for capturing other insects. We all know the praying mantid. Um, tiny babies are really hard to see. We've got the lacewing up here. Uh, this is the larva. Some of the larva will, and some species will pile trash on themselves. So when you see them walking, it looks like a pile of trash that's moving along. Their eggs are laid on stalks. Um, the uh, assassin bugs, there's numerous uh, species of those. Uh, they will, uh, they have that pointy sucking mouth part. This is the, these are the eggs of the uh, milkweed assassin bug. They're, they're easily to rec easy to recognize, sort of an angular mass. And uh, later on, we'll look at some of the eggs from some of the other uh, insects. So they do not lay them like that. So if you see that, you wanna definitely save it. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think that's it. So remember that less than 1% of insects are pests. And also remember that insect babies do not always look like the adult. In simple metamorphosis, they look more like the adult than they do in complete metamorphosis. They go through several stages where they grow, molt and grow and molt and grow. And then, uh, then they look, will become, uh, look, will look like what we know as the adult. These still eat plants, or for this particular one, uh, there are some beneficial bugs. These do eat um, some, these are actually true bugs. Uh, these will eat plants. This is the lady beetle, uh, eggs, uh, the larva, we've, we've seen that. The pupa is attached to a plant and it's usually, uh, in this case, for this one, it's usually orange and the adult lady beetle will come from that. Okay, so what are we gonna do for, um, uh, also we've, we've got our beneficial insects, but what are some other things we can do? One of the things is hand picking. A lot of people find this really icky. So they may not want to do it. Take a cup of water with a few drops of soap in it. Uh, I prefer one with a handle on it. And when you know that you've got the pest, that that's a pest, not a good bug, scrape it off into that cup with gloved hands if you want to. And um, uh, that will kill the insect. Um, if you collect them in a container, uh, you do not have to kill the insect in case it's, it is a, uh, like we talked about earlier, in case it's a beneficial insect. You can put them, to get a good photograph, you can put them in the refrigerator for two to three minutes. It might take longer on some of the larger ones. That will slow it down enough that you can put it uh, out and um, take a good picture of it. Uh, but then you can do whatever you feel like you need to do with it after that. Uh, you can use screens to cover and let light and water that will cover and let light and water through your through so that your plants can still receive those. Um, some of them, uh, they're called row covers. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds. You can get them with different holes, different size holes. Uh, you can also uh, find little bags uh, that you can tie around a fruit cluster or something like that. 
I've never seen these in a store, the one that's made of the uh, wire. Uh, it would probably be good for our keeping rabbits, um, rats or mice, birds from your plants. Those would be available online. You can also buy a bridal tool uh, used to make tutus or bridesveil um, at a fabric store. Buy the 54 inch kind. Um, it's gone up since I bought any, but uh, it's not usually over $2 a yard. It's 54 inches wide, and that would cover a pretty good amount of space. If you had your, uh, say, a tomato you had in a cage, you can wrap it around that and that would uh, hopefully protect it. Paper collars, uh, you can make, uh, if you've got seedlings, if you're planting things from seed, like maybe you've got some annuals, some zinnias, some cosmos, something like that, you're planting from, for, from seed. Uh, you can put a little collar around the uh, plant uh, made out of paper, could be a paper towel tube, a toilet paper tube. Uh, be sure you cut it down the side because as your plant grows, you want to be able to take the collar off without uh, damaging the plant. Uh, if it's cardboard and paper, it would eventually uh, uh, be decomposed anyway, but that would be better. Spraying uh, to cut it so that you can get it off. Spraying water under and on top of leaves uh, to remove pests is um, something that we recommend. Uh, you can buy special wands for this. This one has a head that can be moved um, and you can control the, the hardness of the spray. Uh, there are special wands just for this. Uh, don't use a pressure washer sprayer. That's a little bit uh, too much. Uh, you can, if you see one or two damaged leaves, uh, you can break that off and dispose of it or break it off to take your picture, that sort of thing. Uh, no, no need to treat the whole plant if you can, uh, you can remove the problem just by removing a few leaves. Uh, like I said before, on a plant like this, you may want to consider uh, removing the whole plant. So pesticides uh, are another option of control. The term pesticide includes insecticides, fungicides, <clears throat> herbicides, and the EPA evaluates and regulates pesticides. Uh, they do not regulate home recipes. Uh, <clears throat> the active and inert ingredients are stated on the container Instructions for use are stated on the container and you should follow them. Biological pesticides are de derived from living organisms. Chemical pesticides are formulated by a chemical process. <clears throat> you probably want to uh, minimize the use of chemical pesticides um, in, in your garden if you can. Before using any pesticide, you need to know what you're treating. It's not a good idea <clears throat> to see some damage and go out and treat it with treat it with just anything. Indiscriminate use will kill native predators, pollinators, decomposers, as well as harming other plants of the environment, like uh, having runoff into water sources. Uh, once you identify the pest, uh, then you can consult our hotline, our county agent, or go online like we talked about and search for yourself. Um, I would uh, caution you that um, using um, information online about what chemical pesticides to use is not always a good idea. <clears throat> be smart, be safe, pesticides are toxic, they're meant to kill. Uh, steps should be taken to minimize exposure to people, animals, and the environment. Keep them in a safe place away from children. Minimize personal exposure, ex, uh, exposure by using gloves, eye protection, and do not breathe sprays and dust. If you can smell it, it's getting in your nose. Uh, read directions every time you use it. Oh, I used this last year. I know what to do. Don't depend on that. If the instruction for measurements is given in milliliters instead of, or ounces instead of parts of a cup, you may need to figure out how much that is. Uh, do that instead of guessing. You also need to follow the directions. 
A good source of information about specific pesticides is available at the National Pesticide Information Center. And that link is in uh, the um, uh, resources. <clears throat> Biological products for pest control are some of the safer ones to use. That doesn't mean they won't kill beneficial insects. Um, BT is a strain, uh, well, it's several strains of bacteria. If you want to control mosquitoes, you have to get the one for mosquitoes. Black flies would also be in, controlled by that. Caterpillars have their own special BT and some beetles can be treated with BT their larva and uh, those that would be listed on the label. Spinosad is a mixture of two natural products produced by bacteria in the soil. It affects the nervous system of insects like these. Most of these are tiny thrips, uh, spiders, mites, uh, ants, um, <clears throat> fruit flies and other things like that. Pyrethrins are from a, some, a certain kind of chrysanthemum flower. It affects the nervous system of mosquitoes, fleas, moths, ants, and others. Um, there are some synthetics called pyrethroids that are chemical, but they are made to mimic the pyrethrins. Neem products come from the neem tree. These have been used for probably hundreds of years, uh, maybe even more. The uh, neem oil itself blocks the spiracles of insects, which is the way they breathe and can, will also control um, several fungal and bacterial diseases. Soaps and oils may not be biological. Some of them uh, may be considered biological because they come from uh, animal fats and vegetable fats. Um, they are made uh, from the animal and vegetable oils. They can be effective for the control of scale which is a hard one to control. Aphids, white flies, and others. Dorm, if it says it's a dormant oil, it needs to be sprayed when the uh, plant is dormant. So let's talk about some of the harmful insects that are in your garden. And these aphids are probably in your garden right now. Uh, this has been a great year, a great summer for aphids because they like it when it's hot and dry. <clears throat> And uh, they are sucking insects. In fact, several of the next ones are going to be sucking insects, meaning they can poke their mouth part into the plant and suck juices out. Aphids um, usually um, take more than they can use. And so that part of their excrement is sweet, very sweet. After metabolism uh, of the juices they suck from the plant, a sugary excrement is produced and they uh, drop that on your plant and then you get sooty mold on it. The, um, this one is a red aphid. They can come in any color, red, yellow, black, orange, green, lots of different colors. The black stuff that you see on this plant, the black is sooty mold. The white uh, that you see there and here are the uh, exoskeletons. As they grow, they molt, and that's what the white uh, is. Um, this uh, uh, aphid, the yellow aphid, um, is a, um, I think it's a uh, uh, crepe myrtle aphid. Um, it uh, is very common, and one of the things it's most common on is the um, milkweed that you're growing in your garden for monarchs. Uh, you certainly wouldn't want to spray anything on that because you would endanger the uh, caterpillars uh, that are on your milkweed. Um, they are interesting. Uh, aphids can, can have wings. They cannot have wings. They can give, they're born pregnant. They can have babies for a certain period of time. Their babies are even pregnant. So they multiply rapidly, very rapidly. One of the easiest things to do the, with these is uh, put on a pair of gloves if you're squeamish. They're on the bottom of leaves and on the, maybe on the tops of leaves or on a stem and you can crush them with your fingers. If you wash them off with water and they happen to be eating, they most of the time leave their mouth part in the plant. So they're going to die. 
So that's a good way, uh, a good thing to do also. If you happen to see um, the uh, little brown structures that are uh, uh, in among the aphids, that was an aphid that was parasitized by a wasp, a tiny little wasp. So those are dead. If you see a lot of those, that means you have a lot of activity from those little wasps and uh, you definitely want to keep them there. Aphids are eaten by lacewing larvae, lady beetle larvae, serpent fly larvae. They're parasitized by those wasps and even hummingbirds will eat them. Leaf hoppers um, and plant hoppers uh, have, are another thing that I've seen a lot in my uh, garden this year, this summer. Uh, this one especially, it leaves this, uh, these little fibers uh, on, on a plant. Uh, these are kind of hard to crush with your fingers because they won't be still. Um, but uh, the nymphs are, sometimes the nymphs are, uh, are under a, a coating like this and they're easy, or, uh, easy to, to crush and get rid of. Other times, uh, I don't, you usually don't have to resort to pesticides on these. This is pretty serious damage. Most of the time the damage you see will be like the leaf here at the bottom that has the stippling, uh, just little, little white dots on them. Uh, some of these do transmit disease um, and they have their own very own assassin bug, uh, the leafhopper assassin bug. There are other things that will, birds will pick these off too, other things that will eat them. The uh, spider mites uh, will suck juices out of your plant. Great year for spider mites too. Um, they um, multiply very rapidly. They also become resistant to pesticides. So try something before you try a pesticide. Uh, they can be present in huge numbers um, and they multiply rapidly. The red spider mite um, is the one that we most often think about. You, you cannot see these without a lens of some sort. You might be able to see a little thing running along but to determine what it is, and these are not insects, these are um, arachnids, relatives of spiders. They have eight legs. Uh, the red spider mite and the two spotted spider mite are pretty common. Uh, the leaves of this marigold are white. That's because they have a lot of stippling on it. Sometimes in uh, vegetable gardens, people will plant marigolds to be a trap plant, but if you plant marigolds there, uh, you may also be inviting uh, spider mites into your garden. Spider mites love tomatoes. Uh, when you have a plant that looks like this one at the bottom, um, you're probably going to need to at least move, remove the parts of the plant that are that infested. Uh, put it in a bag, have a bag ready before you move it so that you don't dislodge any of them. Spider mites travel by wind um, and they can travel from plant to plant. You may have it on one and then the next thing you know, it's on the one next to it. Indoor plants can get spider mites too. So we have a tiny predatory beetle and some predatory mites that will eat uh, spider mites. White flies are noticeable when uh, there's a lot of them present. If there's just a few, you may not see them, but you may walk by a plant and a bunch of little white things fly away. And those are spider mites. They have a waxy coating on them also. Uh, they tend to hang out underneath the leaves. The populations can get very large. The, um, the uh, larva of uh, the uh, white fly which is not really a fly, it's a true bug. Um, but the larvae sometimes have a lot of fibrous material over them, which also makes it hard to treat them. Um, you can use some biological controls on this, uh, this one also. Tiny predatory mite, uh, tiny predatory lady beetle also uh, will feed on, uh, on the uh, white flies. Mealybugs, uh, haven't seen too many of them this year in my garden anyway, 
Uh, they're members of the scale family, so uh, they're a little bit different. They still have sucking mouth parts. They can be seen uh, sometimes as just one, but more often you will, first time you'll notice them is when you have a lot. These also get on house plants. Um, they produce a lot of eggs. They have a waxy coating on them so that uh, they're, they are difficult uh, to control. Uh, they, they have a lot of eggs and it's usually underneath the female. Uh, and um, so it's, the, uh, the little babies are protected. Uh, and as they grow, this would be a smaller one. There's a bigger one. This is probably a large uh, female. So um, those can be controlled with um, some of the insecticidal soaps uh, because that would break down the, um, the waxy coating. Uh, horticultural oils, neem oil. Remember the oils. If it's got oil in the name, you need to be sure it, whether it can be sprayed at any time of the year or if it just needs to be sprayed when it's dormant. Um, neem oil is uh, good if you can apply, in fact, uh, any of the pesticides that you use should be applied when you can apply it to some of the very young. Um, there are tiny lady beetles uh, like this one. That one is eating a mealybug. The interesting thing about that one is her larva looks like a little mop, just sort of like the, uh, the mealybugs do. So you wouldn't, you want to, if you've got a lot of those, uh, they'll do their work. The um, scale insects are um, another waxy covered uh, insect. There are two, two main stages. There's a crawler and there is a, um, the adult. The adult does not move, the crawler does move. Uh, they're, if you don't have very many, they're pretty easy to remove by hand. Um, these you often see on, um, you may even see these on some of your ornamental grasses. Uh, you can kind of scrape those off. If you, can, if you get there fast enough, uh, early enough, in the, uh, you can uh, kind of scrape those off and, and you don't have to use a pesticide on them. This is soft brown scale. Um, the, um, they have a stage that, is, that moves, that's a crawler. And then they have a stage in this particular one that is covered with a white substance. Um, interesting, another interesting thing about scale insects, especially ones like this, um, ants will farm them. They will uh, take the honeydew from them and uh, take care of them actually and protect them. Uh, and they don't usually have uh, sooty mold. Some of these others will have sooty mold. There is a small predatory wasp that will lay its eggs on scale in the, um, in the early soft stages. It's not the only predator, but it is uh, one of the predators. Um, you, in, on uh, scale and mealybugs, um, you can try, uh, if, you, if you just have a few, you can try a Q-tip uh, with um, rubbing alcohol on it, dabbing it on those, and sometimes that works. Uh, sometimes it may not work. Um, the, this is crepe myrtle bark scale and the cy cycad scale. Oops. Um, they, um, uh, the crepe myrtle bark scale is, is new here. Um, but it has been around since uh, for a long time. It's just kind of new getting here. Actually, it's been here for, for several years. We're seeing it in Fort Bend County now though. Uh, it uh, comes on, gets on your plant. You don't notice it until the stems start turning black. And um, then you look and you see there's all kinds of little crawly things on it. Um, the scale itself is white and uh, sort of fuzzy looking. Uh, the females uh, have their eggs under them. And so those little holes are where the new ones came out. Um, these two little things right here, let's see. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, that's a little closer look at it. These two things are lady beetle larvae and they will eat the, the scale uh, insects, especially the crawlers. Um, the um, twice stabbed lady beetle uh, will is, that's where these come from. Uh, they, will, they will eat a lot of them. If you have the predators and you get this, catch this early enough, then you may be able to control it without using a pesticide. There is, um, there are several uh, <clears throat> pest, uh, chemical pesticides that can be used on these. Um, you could contact, if this is pretty easy to identify, so you could contact uh, your county agent or the hotline and find out uh, what chemical pesticides might be available for those. Um, the, <clears throat> Whoops, the uh, cycad, cycad scale is on, uh, found here on uh, the uh, sago palms that we have in our, right beside our front doors a lot of times, uh, maybe in the wrong place. Uh, they're not native to here, nor is the crepe myrtle. They um, sometimes are covered in the scale before somebody notices it or decides to do something about it. All of the white would be scale insects. Um, so those that's waiting a little bit late. Um, removal of the whole plant would be good. Uh, the freeze that we had several years ago, the really bad freeze with Storm Uri, um, that killed a lot of sago palms back to the ground and may have eliminated some of the scale. Um, you may still be seeing, you can see this from the street uh, in someone's yard. Uh, it can be treated, uh, but you have to consider whether it's worth the, the time and the money because it, it can get uh, rather expensive. There's another tiny, tiny little lady beetle that uh, will feed on the scale. When the infestation gets as bad as these two, you're going to need a lot of uh, predators uh, to control these. Uh, you should be encouraging the predators to be there all the time, but um, those two things you would definitely want to contact uh, an expert about. The leaf-footed bug is really common. A lot of times we think of it as being a pest on fruit like this one on tomatoes. Uh, but they also will damage blooms on flowers uh, or plants, the, especially the new growth where things are just starting to grow. This particular one right here, you see crawling on your house even in the winter uh, because they'll come out to get warm in the sun. Um, the um, eggs are laid in strips uh, like this. Uh, they can be on the side of your house. They can be on a plant. Uh, they can be on just about anything. Um, when the eggs hatch, they normally all hatch close to the same time. They look like little spiders, the uh, young do. Uh, as they grow and they molt, they change a little bit, starting to look more like the adult. This one has a real leaf foot on that hind leg. This one is not so pronounced, but this one I think is probably more common here. Predators are the assassin bugs. The bur uh, birds will eat these, it's, it's big. They also stink, but that doesn't bother uh, if you squish them. That doesn't bother uh, birds apparently. Uh, the feather-legged fly is a predator. I don't think we, any of us probably ever saw one, but they're out there. They, have, they look like this. Um, they, um, and uh, any, any, ki any kind of predator assassin bug uh, will uh, eat these. Uh, usually you can control these without using very many uh, pesticides. And if you do use pesticides, they are much more effective on the nymphs, the young ones, than they are on uh, the adults. Leaf miners, we looked at uh, this one at the bottom, we looked at it earlier. Uh, leaf miners eat inside of a leaf. This is the citrus leaf miner moth. Uh, it lays its eggs on the uh, leaf and 
the, the uh, little uh, larva eats its way all the way through the plant. So here's the larva right here where the, the uh, arrow is. There's another one over here. This one is getting close to the edge. When they get close, to, they get close to the edge, they're pretty mature and they are uh, ready to become a pupa. And so the pupa comes out at the edge, falls to the ground and it's in the ground. I do think that maybe one of the things when you see birds scratching around under your plants, uh, if you've got citrus trees and you see them there, they may be getting some of those. The, uh, they may be, uh, there's, there are a lot of different kinds of leaf miners. They may be pests on vegetables, like this one is on a tomato. Uh, they can be pests on the fruit itself, uh, even citrus fruit, uh, and they can be pests on other ornamental plants. This, this one is a, a leaf miner fly that lays its eggs there. The um, um, parasitic wasp, The parasitic wasp uh, lays its eggs on the ones that are in that are inside the leaf. There's very few of them, a uh, few insects that do that. The um, cabbage looper is a little green caterpillar. I've got pictures of moths on here. That doesn't make much difference to you because you probably won't see the moth. You'll see the caterpillar. The um, they eat just about everything, but lots of birds will take care of those. Uh, these are, are bagworms. Uh, you see those on evergreens, um, even some plants. This was on an um, angel trumpet plant and it was huge. Uh, there, uh, they use uh, parts of the plant to camouflage their bag, which you can hardly tear open with your hands. Uh, the moth doesn't look much like a moth. It has clear wings. Uh, if you want to control these, you have to do something to them. BT works with them. In uh, the young stage, when they are crawling out of, when they're hatching and then crawling out of the bag. The uh, tobacco hornworm, uh, we talked about that one earlier. And um, then we have cutworms that will eat plants off at the ground. Uh, the, the caterpillars, all of these can be controlled with BT. We had the problem with the cell, cell, uh, sod worms earlier. I guess it was probably a couple of years ago. But the, the moth is kind of significant there because you'll know you've got them if you walk across your grass and you see a lot of these. Um, some caterpillars disguise themselves. You may see their, their frass before you see them. This is the asp that uh, it will uh, sting you. So don't touch that. They're in oak trees sometimes. The moth is rather interesting. We have web worms. All of the, these two form webs. If you can break the web open, uh, a wasp and birds will eat these. Otherwise you would treat with BT, which is kind of hard if they're in a tree. Uh, the live oak tussock moth was around this spring. Uh, they will let themselves down on a silken string. Uh, if you crush one of those on your skin, they will also sting. These things may lay hundreds of eggs in one mass. So it's best if we can get them before they get to that point. Beetles, uh, with the calligraphy beetles kind of go unnoticed until they really get uh, started. They eat uh, with their mouths. These are all chewing insects. And uh, the adult doesn't do as much damage as the, um, the, the young ones do. On your milkweed, you'll have these. Uh, this is a swamp milkweed beetle. And then another one that I saw a lot of this year were the flea beetles. These are tiny little beetles and they eat tiny little holes in all of your plants. Uh, they would be, uh, they're a little bit harder to, uh, to control. Uh, we see them on ornamentals as well as on um, uh, vegetables. I put some blister beetles in here because we're, I'm seeing more of these in my yard, not particularly this one. Some of them are striped, some of them are brown. Some of them uh, have wing covers that don't go very far back. A blister beetle is able to exude a poison, uh, irritating poison from its joints. And if you get that, if you touch these, get that on you, then uh, it can make a blister, literally make a blister. They, uh, they do eat some uh, plants, mostly grasses. 
So some diseases that we uh, might want to talk about. Um, the uh, galls that are formed on plants, um, we have um, uh, the oak trees have lots of them. Those are usually the result of a wasp or a fly that lays their egg on the tissue. The tissue grows around it and then the, the uh, larva can eat inside of it. The, um, so these don't really cause very much damage. Poison ivy even has its own special gall that forms on it. So I guess we can only hope that the poison ivy would be as miserable as us. Um, there is really no control for this because there's, there's not really a big problem with it. So diseases, um, they can be caused by viruses, bacteria, fungus, nematodes, uh, the symptoms are stunted growth, spots on the leaves, decay on the stems, uh, distorted leaves. Uh, you can see um, discoloration of leaves, discoloration of fruit or flowers, wilted plants, uh, gardeners, and you need to take steps to control these quickly. Um, these uh, are uh, a little more difficult con to control. They also don't really occur on in, in huge amounts. Um, so sometimes they're easier to control just by, um, just by removing parts of the plant. Some of them are not controllable. There is no cure. So powdery mildew is the white stuff that forms on plants. If you catch these early enough, you can uh, use, um, you can break them off. Uh, a lot of times this is caused by too much water being left on your plant um, and uh, are just humid and uh, warm conditions, which we have a lot of. Um, the sooty mold, we talked about that earlier, is from the excrement of aphids and other small insects. Uh, Entomosporium leaf spot is on uh, Indian hawthorn and Fatinia. These were plants that were used extensively in our area. Uh, people treated them with all kinds of uh, insecticide or, or pesticides, um, and they still got this disease every year on new growth. Uh, I think we're not using these so much, and there are some resistant varieties now that you can use uh, in your garden. Um, this is very hard to control. You can pick up the leaves that fall off and dispose of them. Uh, you cannot let the leaves stay wet. That means overhead watering should be done when it would dry out. Same spot thing for black spot. This is also a fungus uh, on roses. Uh, there are things that you can use. Uh, let's see, uh, potassium bicarbonate is something that can be used uh, uh, to uh, control fungus. Uh, some of the oils, neem oil, can also uh, help control those. Um, crown gall is caused by a bacteria. Uh, the uh, bacteria are, uh, causes these to grow in um, uh, on the, the part of the plant that usually, not always, part of the plant that grows close to the ground. So in roses, it's called the crown gall. And in crepe myrtles, it is a crown gall because it uh, originates there, but then these growths uh, start to appear. Both of these, you really just need to get rid of the plant. There's, there is nothing that uh, not really the disease is systemic, but you cannot use, these things are not gonna go away. They're going to be there. So you need to look at plants carefully when you're purchasing them. And that's the case for everything you buy, look at it. Uh, some diseases are in greenhouses. They do treat for it, but maybe they didn't get them all. So look at your plants very carefully, any of them when you're buying them. And there are resistant, uh, uh, Crepe myrtles, there are resistant roses to these. So you can look for a list that gives you some of those. Um, the bacterial spot and uh, is uh, another thing that is caused by a bacteria. This one is, is um, kind of interesting because the others, you notice when the plant is dry, even the water may have caused it, these may appear wet. So if you have this discoloration on them, this is on geranium. Those are bedding type plants. Uh, 
so um, that would be new. Don't think you can nurse that back to health because it, it's in the plant. Um, and this is on begonia. Uh, roses, it looks like a spot, um, but uh, proper diagnosis would be needed to, uh, would be needed because this kind of looks like just regular black spot uh, before you do any treatment or before you dump the plant. Uh, this one may also occur on the fruit uh, like tomatoes. The tobacco to uh, mosaic viruses are interesting um, because that is the tobacco mosaic virus is the first one that was uh, is the first virus that was ever studied, mostly for economic reasons. And, uh, but we didn't know what it looked like until uh, the 1960s, because that's when we got the electron microscope that could show us what a virus looked like. Uh, rose mosaic virus um, is uh, also uh, one that, that none of these can be cured since they're a virus, no vaccine. Um, it can be also, this one is on petunias. Uh, these two down here are plants that are sold because of the virus. Uh, this is called the Dancing Flames Salvia. It's been out for several years now. It's got sort of a yellowish mottled foliage that some people like. I think I'd have trouble buying it, but it is said, uh, they say that this virus is not trans transmittable, uh, but it could be if you took, it would be on the plant if you took cuttings and grew, grew the plant from that or if you grafted the plant onto something. Tulip breaking virus was discovered long, long ago. It was used in paintings that the Dutch masters did like Rembrandt. Uh, it was caused by a virus. Nowadays we get um, tulips that look like this and they uh, are genetic mutations which is what a lot of the variegation is that you see in plants. Uh, if you've got stripes, uh, lighter spots in the leaves, something like that, that's usually a genetic mutation. So you don't control that and you don't control these. If you are cutting on things with viruses, you need to be sure that you uh, clean your hands, clean your tools uh, that you've used. Uh, you can do that with, with alcohol, and um, then you want to get rid of those plants, get them out of your garden. Rose rosette disease is common. Uh, it's transmitted by, a, it's a virus transmitted by a um, mite. Uh, it will uh, cause your plant to, your rose plant to um, have bunchy growth, lots of thorns. Uh, don't even try to treat this. Take the plant out and put it in a bag and put it in the, gar in the garbage. I can't tell you how many people in the world who had a whole row of uh, knockout roses uh, tried to treat this and it didn't work. They were just part of the problem of spreading it around. Aster yellows is transmitted by a leafhopper that likes to spend the winter in our area and uh, causes bunchy growth on uh, plants. It's not very attractive. Here's Vinca, uh, Lantana. Uh, it's also on um, Echinacea, distorts the petals, the leaves, everything. Those plants need to be removed. Nematodes are actually the first we talk, we talk about caterpillars and call them worms half the time. They're not worms. This is a real worm. And uh, they uh, attack plant roots, but then they cause the plant to not be, uh, not get uh, the proper nutrition. The roots will have little knots on them. Uh, legumes also have little knots. They don't look like this necessarily, but um, these, uh, these plants are gonna have to be destroyed and taken out of the garden also. There are some treatments for these. Um, trying to sterilize, not really sterilize, but trying to get rid of them in the soil. You can use Elbon rye and a few other things, but you'd want to be sure that's what you have by contacting an expert before you start any treatments. Uh, plants that you have in your landscape, like zinnias, petunias, marigolds, daisies, shasta daisies, ajuga is one of the worst, vinca, trailing lantana, tomatoes, okra, pumpkins, all of those can have nematodes on them. 
Okay, do we have any questions? I didn't even slow down. Uh, I don't see any questions so far, Nancy. Okay. No. So we can continue. Uh, okay, well, that was it. That's all I have. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So if anybody has any questions, it's a great time to unmute yourself and ask her. Ask Nancy, and she'll be glad to clear those questions. Try to clear. <laughs> or if there's anything that somebody's seeing that we didn't talk about, there's many, many things we didn't talk about. Yeah. Looks like nobody has any more questions. Oh, hi, Nancy. This is Emma Dow. Hey, Emma. Hello, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know if this is a pest question. So this is, my question is, is this a pest question? I have a fire bush that seems to create mutations and also a Texas mountain laurel that creates mutations off its, um, off their flowers. Is that a pest issue? Um, okay, tell me the name of the plant again. Texas what, mountain? The Texas mountain laurel, and then the other is um, a firebush. Firebush, not sure which one that one is. The mountain laurel, um, I would think something's going on there. Um, maybe something is causing, is it like uh, distorted leaves? It's not from the leaves, it's actually from the flower, between the flower and the seed pod, and it, it creates just a random, odd, long, weird, flat growth. Okay, I think I have seen that and I, I am not sure what that is. Uh, doesn't seem to be harming your plant though. No, not at all. And it's only like in one spot and it happens every oh. year. Oh. It's an alien plant. It's what? It's an alien plant. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I doubt that. <laughs> uh, I think but if it is in the same spot, uh, then it could be something like you were describing, something as a mutation or something. If it really bothers you, which I guess it doesn't, if you've had it for a while, you could try taking that part off and seeing if it happens anywhere else. Mm -hmm. I, I think I have seen that. Um, I don't think I have it on mine, but I think I have seen that. Uh, mm -hmm. Texas Mountain Laurel, if you haven't, uh, looked at it if, if you're not familiar with it is a native plant with purple flowers in the spring very interesting seed pods uh, it's not hard to grow uh, there is a caterpillar that eats it occasionally i haven't seen that one in a few years so and what was the other plant the firebush is that your um it's a hemelia hemelia okay no i've never seen anything on hemelia like that it's very similar. It's a very similar looking growth. 
I don't know, maybe we should take a picture of it and send it to somebody who knows more than we do. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. Hey, Nancy. This is uh, this is Patrick. Okay. I um, uh, yesterday you were, you were looking at um, some lantana in a, in the demonstration garden in the superstar garden, mm -hmm. and uh, did you figure out what the problem was with our lantana? Uh, no, uh, we looked at that with a uh, hand lens and we couldn't see anything on it. Um, the one thing that none of us did was go down. We, we noticed that it was on, only on the top part uh, of the plant. It wasn't down in the plant. Uh, and uh, maybe we should have looked at those that are farther down in the plant. Maybe there were some pests down there. It does look like the stippling from spider mites, uh, leaf hoppers, if there were plenty. I think you guys would have noticed that any, any insect on it by now. Spider mites would have made their web and you would have noticed that. Yeah. So I'm not sure. There's some stippling that can occur from nutri nutritional uh, issues. Uh, so we'll need to get one of the authorities. This is in an extension garden, by the way, to anybody else listening. We'll have to get somebody else to check those out. Sounds like it's a um, uh, bring it into the hotline next it Wednesday. Sounds, sounds like it, but I had a hotline guy look at it. <laughs> <laughs> Another hotline. Okay. Okay. I, okay. Yeah. Try another hotline. They they looked very healthy though, except they weren't blooming, were they? No, they weren't. That was why we started looking at them. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think the other expert will be back in a week or so, and we can ask him. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. And uh, if there are no more questions, I think we will wrap this up. But if you do have anything to ask, please do do so. Yes, remember that questions and photos can be sent to our hotline. They're it's a very good group of people for um, finding out what's wrong with your plant. Yeah. Thank you, Nancy, so much for uh, covering this all important topic. We are always struggling with uh, pests and diseases. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard to pull out the plant and throw it away. But, <laughs> you know, I guess we have to do that. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. If you think about uh, the fact that heavily invested, infested things are spreading disease in most cases, then it makes it a little easier. So you mentioned that thing about the lantana, uh, if we cut it back, we, the new growth, will it come back with the same uh, virus or bacteria? Well, I don't think the lantana is a virus or a bacteria. I think it's probably, uh, it's probably an insect that we're just not seeing uh, oh. or something that happened to it earlier. Uh, it's um, one of the things that we usually say about plants uh, is to give them space uh, with some good air circulation. I don't really think the fact that that is really uh, uh, close, uh, the, the leaves and the stem are close and the plants are really close in that garden. I don't think that's probably the problem there, but that is something to keep in mind when you're planting plants to give them room to grow I think that was probably covered in basics. Uh, you uh, you want to be sure to look at how big it's going to get. And even though it looks like a little bitty thing, but it's still going to get 20 feet tall, you need to give it room for that so you don't have to move it. Lantanas won't get that big. Yeah, yeah. No, they spread yeah. more. Yeah. Another thing on uh, lantana that gets on lantana is lace bugs. And we we did not see those. But, we'll, we'll but have when I first saw that on my lantern, I thought it's like getting green flowers instead of the colorful flowers. Oh, <laughs> they, okay. they did look like flowers. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now you're talking about a different thing. You're not talking about the one that Patrick talked about. You're talking about uh, 
the um let's see where was that yeah i saw your slide and it yeah. looked like that yeah, yeah that one that one yeah and that, that one. you can't do anything about that you got to take it out you can try cutting it off but i think you're going to have it all okay over. yeah okay. yes we had it on lantana in uh the butterfly garden and we took that took it out um and I've had it on mine and I have taken out all of mine except the native uh, lantana. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you know, that one is uh, a phytoplasm, which is a bacteria that doesn't have, sort of like a bacteria that doesn't have a cell wall. And uh, it's transmitted by the leafhoppers. I, I've never seen a leafhopper uh, that I thought was on a, on a lantana uh, that was doing that or any other plant. But we do have it in the extension gardens and on several things. It'll get on vegetables. Can you imagine broccoli? Because <laughs> yeah. it will get on broccoli. Wow. Okay. So thank you again so much for uh, spending your afternoon with us. Everybody who registered will get a copy of the video as well as the links. And we also have a survey uh, which will help us tremendously to either continue the programs or introduce new programs. So if you can uh, take a couple of minutes to do the survey when you get it in your email, that will be greatly appreciated. Uh, so we can all work towards uh, making these programs more useful to you down the road. Thank you again. Thank you, Nancy, for coming. And thank you, everybody, for coming to the talk today. So we'll see you next month uh, for another class. Okay, thank you.